Hi all, it's Justine McNally here from Local Land Services um, in the northwest of New South Wales. I'm the district vet based in Moree and I just want to welcome everyone um, to this webinar and I hope you all get something out of it in relation to Flystrike. We've been really fortunate to get Narell Sales from New South Wales DPI to present and narell has got um, three decades of experience um, around both fly strike and, and lice control. So we're really fortunate to have Narell talking to us today. And um, what we're going to do soon is a very, very quick poll. And it was just so uh, Narell and myself can see what products people have been using um, over the last 12 months around fly and lice control, which is a little bit of crossover with the chemicals there. And some of you would have got my email yesterday in relation to that, just to um, give you a little bit of a heads up to go and have a look on um, on the labels of the, of the containers you've got at home. But hopefully you've got those written down because in the poll questions, I've mm -hmm. done it so that they've got, um, they've they've got their, their chemical ingredient name and I've got just an example um, next to them of one of the generic um, brand names. But yeah, it'd be really helpful for us to get a little grip on what people are using. Um, okay, so um, hopefully everyone can hear me and um, what we might do, we've got quite a few people on now, we might just head to the poll questions. They'll come up on your screen and just tap on the answer that um, that applies to you. Okay. So I'll give you a, you know a little bit of time to answer, but we're just going to go with the first one, and um, that is what is the active ingredient of the uh, lice control um, program you'd use? So if people want to start trying to um, answer that. Hopefully I've done the right thing. Okay, that's great. Thanks guys. So just out of interest, um, it looks like most people have either used um, that imidacloprid or spinosad. So that's that's fairly, and there's some that have used ivermectin and a little bit of the others. Okay. Um, so what did you use for um, 2020 fly control? So I'll just launch that. Okay, I'll close that out. So most people here look to be using something like click the dicyclinol and then a smattering between the other things. Okay, the third question is, what have you used as your dressing treatment? Okay, looks like most people have got their votes in. Um, so on that one, it looks like most people are using Spinosad and then the breakdown otherwise is between OPs and Ivermectin. Um, and then the next question is, what were you thinking of using for this season's preventative treatment? So looking at this, we've got about two thirds of people are thinking of using dicyclinol and then around that 20% mark for imidacloprid and um, cyramazine. So there's a few for the others, but that's good, thanks. Okay, and then the very last question is, what were you thinking of using for this season's dressing treatment?
Okay, it looks like most people are going to be using that sort of two thirds will be using Spinosad and then the other 20% um, OPs or ivermectin. So that's great. Okay. Thank you everyone for doing that. I'll just give you a little bit of a hand as we move through the presentation because you'll um, be able to sort of follow what Narelle's talking about and just alerts you to, to the chemicals that you're using. Um, okay, just moving on now, just before Narelle starts, I'd just like to do acknowledgement of country. So we've got this nice artwork that I was shared by a work colleague who's helping me with this webinar, Leone. But I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land where I am today, the Kamilaroi people, and their elders, past, present, and emerging. Okay, I think with uh, no further ado, we might just move on to um, Narelle's presentation. So I'll just share the screen with Narelle. Just bear with me for five seconds. So. Hopefully, there we go. Narelle, it's over to you. Well, thank you very much, Justine, and thank you for inviting me to give this talk today. Um, as Justine said, I work at the uh, Elizabeth MacArthur Agricultural Institute, which is approximately 1,600 hectares. Uh, we have laboratory facilities, we ha can do pen trials, pasture trials, and we even have um, biosecu high biosecurity facilities on site. Um, I've worked on ectoparasites of livestock for more than 30 years, but about 30 years for the department. So the information I'm gonna provide today um, the data that I'm going to provide um, can be found in this final report that's on the AWI website, uh, which is listed here. Um, and um, the advice comes from a working party that was put together by AWI on the back of the findings of um, this project. And... So as you all know, I'll just go through some of the basic stuff to start with. Um, I don't need to show anybody um, a picture of fly strike there on the left. These are pretty much fully grown maggots. Um, these are what they look like when they're all cleaned up. This dark bit here you can see is uh, their crop that's full. So they've been actively feeding. And this picture here is of a male um, fly. Lucilia caprina initiates um, more than 90% of strike in Australia, and that's why we call it the primary sheep blowfly. There's really good general information in a New South Wales DPI prime fact, number 485, which you can access on the website. There are what we call secondary flies, which come in once that strike is initiated. These Big so here's the normal one, Lucilia caprina, that will initiate it. And these big brown ones, um, you know, we call them brown blowflies or some people call them brown bombers. Um, their maggots are a bit larger um, and look a slightly different colour. And then this one here on the far right hand side is Chrysomyia rufifaces. And the larvae for that are these ones that we call spiky or hairy maggots. And usually these are the last sort of invaders. And when you see them, um, you know that the strike's been there for a while. And these are the ones that really have that capacity to uh, actually end up causing death, um, septicemia and death in the sheep. Um, so this is this is what you probably are all pretty familiar with. I just like to point out that um, there's fly strike you see and fly strike you don't see. So we call the fly strike you don't see covert strike. And there was a great study done back in 1984 by Wardo and Dalwitz, and they found that strike can continue for up to two months without being able to be detected. They also found that um, depending on the sheep type and the season, that covert strike that you can't see may be five to 14 times more prevalent than the overt strike, the strike that you can actually pick up and see. 
This is a life cycle of a fly, of the um, sheep blowfly, which you're all familiar with, but we'll just go through it quickly. Um, female flies lay eggs on the fleece. These hatch out into what we call larvae or um, maggots. And uh, when they hatch out, they're what we call first instar. Maggots are exactly like a snake and they need to shed their skin to be able to grow to the next stage. So they actually shed their skin twice. So they go first instar, second instar, third instar, growing the whole time. So that maggot stage occurs on the sheep. When those maggots are fully fed, um, they will enter what we call a wandering phase where they drop from the sheep and they'll burrow into the soil. Now, if the soil is less than 15 degrees, they'll go into this stage here, which is known as a pre-pupa, and they'll stay in that stage until the soil warms up. And this is why you get a fly wave at the beginning of the season, because the soil warms up and these will continue to progress through to pupae and then the flies em em emerge virtually as a synchronised um, population. If the soil is above 15 degrees, this development goes through normally. When the they sort of go into a soup inside the pupa and then they turn into a fly. When the fly emerges, they burrow what they come back out of the soil and they look like this and they have to blow their wings up and puff themselves up. And then they harden and then they're able to then they're able to fly once they've blown out their wings and hardened up. Their main aim is to mate, with, find a mate and mate, and then, of course, off we go around again when the female lays her eggs. This, uh, you can see this as a time scale, and that is um, temperature dependent. It can be faster under um, hotter temperatures and slower under cooler temperatures. And again, that information is in that prime fact 485 that I mentioned earlier. So the um, co-funded project between AWI and DPI was conducted from November 2017 through to June 2020. And these coloured areas are the areas that we received strains from. And the number in the little grey circle, if you can see that, that's the number of um, samples that we received from um, producers from that area. Bear in mind, most of New South Wales, I think all of New South Wales was under um, drought and there was a fair bit of drought um, in, across Australia. Um, when I say samples were producers submitted samples, um, they actually went out, collected uh, maggots off sheep, put them in containers and sent them in to us. So I'd like to talk about insecticide resistance, but first of all, I'd like to give you a definition of what I mean when we're talking about insecticide resistance and this is an internationally accepted um, definition and it's a really good practical definition. And the few points to notice is a heritable change in the insect and that heritable change means the genetics of the insect have been changed. Um, it talks about um, the sensitivity of the population and that if there's a change, that that will be manifested as um, a re repeated failure of a product. Uh, and I suppose the most important thing here is um, the expected level of control that you would that you're looking for from that product. Uh, in in Australia, we have um, the um, you know, get the process goes through AVPMA and there's a um, protection period that's normally stated on the label. And often that will read something like up to 14 weeks or thereabouts. So a, a genetic change, repeated failure of a product at the expected level um, when it's been used according to label recommendations. So there's two sort of sides to resistance or two ways of looking at resistance. Um, one is the resistance level. That's how high is that resistance? How much insecticide do you need to put on to kill the maggot? 
And the measure that we use so we can compare all of the strains is known as the LC50. And that's the concentration that's required to kill 50% of that population. So it's sort of the benchmark for all strains. And then we can compare the strains when we, t when we look at this single ind indice. Um, when we've calculated that for a field strain, we can um, determine a resistance factor. And we divide that LC50 of the field strain by the LC50 of a strain that we have here in the laboratory that is completely naive to insecticide and we know it's susceptible to everything. So this is our baseline, if you, if you will. Um, and that allows us to calculate a resistance factor. The other side of resistance is resistance frequency. And that refers to how many maggots in that strike or how many flies on the wing are actually resistant in that population. How we determine that in the laboratory is we know what is known as a um, susceptible discriminating concentration. So most chemicals, before they come out on the market, we have access to them and we're able to determine a concentration at which we know all susceptible maggots or flies will be killed. Um, and we can then use that concentration when we get a field strain in, we can screen that field strain with that concentration and we can get a percentage of the population that we know is resistant. You might ask, why do we even bother testing in the laboratory? And we do that for some very good reasons. There are a whole heap of factors that come into play uh, with that fly when she's looking to lay eggs on a sheep. Before she'll even get to that sheep, there's a whole heap of environmental factors. And then there's a whole heap of sheep factors and climatic factors that may mean that she either doesn't get to lay or that when she does lay, those eggs don't hatch. So what we do in the laboratory is we keep the temperature and humidity constant and we rule out all of these factors that uh, have a nil next to them. The most important one, I suppose, really is exposure to other chemicals. So we are only looking at the effect of a single chemical. Um, and in the laboratory, we give them unlimited food and water. So we know that's not a limiting thing. And we're able to dose with highly precise concentrations of insecticide. And we can do that with high um, repetition so that we are, it's valid to be able to compare the results for different strains. This is a table of um, insecticides that are no longer registered prevention for prevention and resistance is like a Sara Lee Danish layer upon layer, if you remember the old ad. So once you stop using um, an insecticide often that resistance remains embedded in the genetics if um, other things have occurred and that becomes part of the backdrop drop of what you're looking at. You'll see from this um, list that OPs are no longer registered for fly prevention. Um, this column is the year that these products were introduced. This is the year that resistance was developed. In the brackets, you'll see how long it roughly took for that resistance to develop. Um, and in the far right hand column is whether or not we included them in um, the 2018 to 2020 um, study. We did include the organophosphates and we included the benzophenol ureas, which are not an IGR. You may remember diflubenzeron and triflumeron, um, and we included that for historical reasons. This is a list of currently registered um, products for fly strike prevention. This is the insecticide group, so that's the name of the group. And when we get later to rotation, this is what we're asking you to rotate between. Um, these are the insecticide names which is what you would need to look at as your active ingredient on products. Um, here's some example products. Um, if you're not familiar with these active ingredient names, again, the year that they were introduced and the year that resistance was detected. 
and in brackets the number of years that it took for that resistance to develop. So you can see here um, Saromazin resistance, um, it was 32 years before resistance was verified in the field. Um, again, dicyclinal resistance was found in 2011 um, as well in a few populations, um, but it was thought to be at low levels and the big news was really um, seromazin resistance. When we started this survey at the very end of 2017, it became pretty clear pretty quickly that things had changed. Um, so I've got 2017 here um, because it was very obvious that um, things had changed fairly dramatically since 2011. The final um, column is um, whether or not there is um, whether or not they, they, the chemicals were included in our study. You'll see here we didn't include um, cypermethrin, which is a synthetic poivre. Sorry, Narelle, you were just Pyrethroid, um, you might know it as Vanquish. Um, it works in a very uh, parallel, sorry, Sorry, Narelle, Sorry, can I just, go on? Yeah, you're coming back on. Sorry, it was just dropping out a little bit. Western Sydney internet, hey? Okay. Yes, it is. Um, so so uh, cypermethrin, um, these products work in a very different way. They paralyse the ovipositor of the fly and she lays scattered eggs rather than laying nice clumps and the eggs, if she lays them at all, um, will desiccate and not hatch. So um, looking at the resistance testing we did for seromazin and dicyclinal, uh, they, because they are an IGR, we had to do a different type of test to the OPs and spinosad and ivermectin and imidloclopred. And in the test for seromazin and dicyclinal, we have to incorporate the insecticide into the food and we put newly emerged first instar larvae on there. So as soon as they hatch out of the eggs, we count them on and then we let them go through their entire development phase on that media. If they feed fully, they come off, they'll form pupae and then they'll hatch out as adults. So when, we, when I say that there were survivors in, um, against seromas and oils dicyclin, I'm actually talking about adult flies have hatched out, not that they've killed maggots. So we, we do that because these are what it, um, will be the next generation to uh, produce strike on your sheep. So when we did the survey um, across Australia, uh, we had 21 samples come in from Western Australia, 12 from South Australia. We did receive three from Tasmania, but unfortunately only one was viable for testing. Victoria, 11, and New South Wales, 55. We had a total of 100. You'll see the colours. The green is... Um, for populations that were susceptible to dicyclinal and seromazin. So uh, no um, adult flies emerged from the assays in these populations. The yellow um, are populations that were just resistant to seromazin and the red are populations that were resistant to both dicyclinal and seromazin. So you can see here in Western Australia, almost 50% of what we received was um, resistant only to seromazin, 28% was resistant to both and 24% were susceptible. Uh, South Australia, um, slightly different again. The one strain we tested in Tasmania was susceptible and in Victoria, um, one strain was susceptible to dicyclin and seromazin, one strain was only seromazin resistant. Uh, the rest were res resistant to both chemicals and in New South Wales, 100% were resistant to both chemicals. In the last year, in 2021, we've actually tested another 23 strains from New South Wales and this story hasn't changed in that time. 
So what's important to producers is that protection period that I was talking about earlier. So they want to know if they put it on their sheep, how many weeks protection will they um will they gain from the use of a product and they really want to know uh, if there is resistance how will that affect that protection period so we um, did a, a um, field um, a pasture-based study and we used what's known as the implant technique now this implant technique takes those newly emerged first instar larvae puts them onto a wet cotton dental wick which is the same as what the dentist puts in your mouth when you visit and um, on the sheep that have been pre-treated that in this trial they were treated six weeks off shears um, we part the wool scarify the area slightly, spray with a spray bottle to slightly moisten, and then we put this um, dental wick with the lar approximately 200 larvae over the top of that area. And then what you see in the red circle there is a bulldog clip, which is used to um, hold it into place. Um, 24, 48 and 72 hours later, we checked on each of those implants. And here you can see a well advanced, these are uh, feeding 13 stars of a well advanced strike on one of the sheep. And um, we sat and picked all the maggots off the sheep that we could find, took them back to the laboratory um, and uh, to see if they would pupate and then to see if um, the adult flies hatched out. So when I say that a strike was positive, I'm actually saying that adult flies emerged um, from the maggots that we removed from the sheep at 72 hours. What I should say is that um, we, down the midline of the sheep, we implanted on one side with a strain that was resistant to dicyclinol and on the other side we implanted with a strain that was susceptible to dicyclinol. So when we did that, um, these are the um, the results for dicyclinol spray-on based products. All of these products were bought across the counter, so it's exactly the same as what a producer would use. This is the low dose one that claims 11 week, up to 11 weeks protection. The red column here um, is uh, the resistant strain. The blue column is the susceptible strain. And along the bottom axis is the number of weeks post-treatment. So again, we staggered the shearing of all of these groups and then um, they were all treated six weeks off shears so that these implants would line up and we adjusted the challenge interval. Uh, we, we challenged every two weeks, but we adjusted when we started, when we first challenged in line with what the um, recommended protection period is. So for the low dose dicyclinol, um, we challenged three weeks post treatment. And you can see with the resistant strain, six out of six sheep were positive. We set a cutoff at three out of six sheep to declare um, uh, sort of the end of the implants for that strain or, or um, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a cut off for, for um, what we classified in this trial as a failure. Um, as you'll see here for this low dose dicyclinal product, the susceptible strain did reach 11 weeks. We didn't have that um, three out of three positive sheep reached until 13 weeks post-treatment. Um, but at three weeks, we had six out of six, and this was um, uh, this was um, backed up at five weeks post-treatment to confirm this first finding. This is the normal dose um, dicyclinol spray-on product that we say um, normally gets 18, up to 18 to 24 weeks um, protection. The first challenge was at four weeks post-treatment and you can see the very first challenge we got three out of the six sheep um, were positive so they met that cutoff. When this was confirmed at six weeks post-treatment where we got five out of six sheep po positive. For the susceptible strain you can see that we actually didn't reach 
the cutoff of three out of six sheep. So the 24 weeks protection was obtained um, against the susceptible strain. For the higher dose spray on product, which uh, gives up to 29 weeks, we challenged for the first week, seven weeks post treatment, and you can see we only got two out of six sheep. So we hadn't reached that cutoff. When nine weeks post treatment, we actually ended up with six out of six sheep, and this was confirmed the following at 11 weeks post treatment, again with six out of six um, sheep positive. Again, the susceptible strain, um, we actually, it met the, uh, and achieved the protection period as on, um, claimed on the label. In that trial, we also hand jetted with um, an ivermectin based product, which um, it claims up to 12 weeks protection. We challenged at four weeks for the first time, but you'll see here it's not until eight weeks that the resistant strain goes above that cutoff, and that was confirmed at 10 weeks. The susceptible strain, once again, we, we achieved the um, protection period that was claimed. And you might wonder why this product only achieved eight weeks when there's a claim of 12 weeks. If you read the label on these products, it will state that um, you will receive up to 12 weeks protection for low to moderate fly strike challenge. Because we've removed um, a lot of the uh, factors around that female getting to, to, the, to lay eggs, um, because we've put first instar larvae on those sheep, it's basically is there enough chemical on that sheep to kill those, to, to kill or, or stop um, in the case of dicycle and seromazin, the development of adults. And so we would classify this as um, a, a not low to medium challenge. So that's why we only got um, eight weeks protection. We also um, hand jetted with seromazin. Uh, which claims up to 14 weeks. And as you'll see, we started challenge three weeks post-treatment, but it wasn't until seven weeks post-treatment that the resistant strain got six out of six um, sheep positive. And once again, we got the claimed protection period against the susceptible strain. This final group here are the untreated control sheep. Uh, this trial ran from August through to the middle of April and in the middle of summer, in, in about here, um, I was sitting picking maggots off sheep at, and it was 45 degrees. Um, and there are environmental tolerances even for maggots um, and we, we, we run untreated controls to make sure that there's no outside influences that would be um, reducing, um, you know, the performance of the maggots or, or, or coming into play. It's also a test of my um, implant technique. And as you can see, for both the susceptible and the resistant strain, for each implant um, opportunity, we got six out of six positive sheep. So where does that leave us with um, resistance, with the information that I've already given you about resistance? So we'll go through again the products that are um, registered for prevention and treatment of um, existing strikes. Uh, and organophosphate, organophosphates, as I said, they're registered as, a, as dressings. They're not um, registered as preventatives. I've also got listed here the um, application technique. So you can see that some are spray on, but others are available for jetting or dipping um, in this column. This column here tells you whether or not that group of insecticides is used for lice and as you can see, these uh, the OPs are, Temophos is still registered for lice, and these bottom four are registered for lice. And the final column is whether or not um, there is um, known resistance at this time um, against that group of insecticides. So I've sort of put this together <laughs> 
uh, in line with the recommendation of that AWI formed working group um, that recommends chemical rotation. And if we start with lice treatment, um, the recommendation is that you, you pick one group of insecticides for lice treatments. And so these are what are available for lice treatments. And I've coloured them different colours so that when you get down here to strike or wound dressing, you can buy colour C. Ivermectin appears here for lice treatments. It appears here as a strike or a wound dressing. And it also appears down here as a preventative treatment. So if we want to collect um, pick one for a lice treatment. Say, for example, um, say for example, we picked um, say we picked ivermectin just for an, a sake of an example. When we get down here to a strike or a wound dressing, we want to pick a different group, and we see oh well, ivermectin is already in that group, but I've used that for lice treatment. One of the things we did do in our study was look at the highly resistant, a strain of um, blowflies that was highly dicyclinal resistant, and we tested them with the registered dressings. And what we found was that the two, really the two best performers were the Extinisad aerosol and the old fly strike powder. I think the fly strike powder works so well because it actually sticks to the maggots. Um, and so say, for example, we picked the um, Spinosad aerosol treatment here. Um, so that knocks it out here. So we've got rid of ivermectin, we've got rid of spinosad, and that leaves us these chemicals for um, pre as a preventative. The alpha cypermethrin is the one that I spoke about which paralyzes the ovipositor of the um, female fly. Um, and so it, it works in a very different way um, and you may not be familiar with that and I'm not sure whether or not, uh, I'm not sure how popular that is, but you need to select a third group there. There's another recommendation that if you treat twice in a season or, or twice in a year even, that you, uh, depending on when your fly season is, whether you have two fly seasons or only one bad one a year, um, that you pick it, rotate to another group again. So what it makes it pretty clear is that there is, if you're going to rotate between groups, you're going to have to use some sort of a wet formulation. And um, what you need to consider before you start down this path is do you even have the equipment to be able to do this? Um, I'm, I don't know, a lot of people have filled in their old-fashioned plunge dips because they weren't long enough according to the recommendations. There are new um, spray races and things that are out there available. But um, if you're going to, you know, to follow this, you, you'd need to have the correct um, equipment to be able to, to apply those wet um, products. The other thing um, that for resistance management that's a good thing to do is to try and reduce your reliance on insecticides. A lot of producers have spent a lot of time, money and effort into breeding sheep that are less susceptible to fly strike. I've got the word there, resistant, and it's probably not a good word to use when I'm talking about insecticide resistance. Um, but, you know, all of those things, um, plainer body, cleaner breech, um, everything that you'd know more about than what I do, really. Um, and to shear and crutch at times to take advantage of the six weeks protection that both of these operations give you. Um, use that to your advantage wherever you can. There's been a lot of work that's proved that if you dock your, the tails of your lambs to the correct length, that it maintains a cleaner breach and a cleaner breach equals less fly strike. Um, and again, cleaner breach by managing scouring um, with effective and strategic drenching. Um, and breach modification um, may be required if you haven't um, sort of got down the path far enough with your breeding just yet. Um, so 
you know, uh, it, it's still a, uh, there are many methods of breach modification and it's still a valid thing. If you do do breach modification, always make sure that those animals are protected, that you're not just putting them out um, out in the middle of a fly strike season where that wound is going to um, get struck. So the overall message is for um, reducing reliance on insecticide is to drench, crutch and shear strategically um, if you're going to use part of this plan. And I know that that's a darn sight easier to say than it pro probably is to do. Um, but some examples of how you might use that six weeks protection from crutching or shearing is if you were to shear or crutch at the beginning of the fly season, then you might only need to have an, a shorter acting um, insecticide applied at the end for the, the second half of the fly strike season. Um, if you crutched, for example, in the middle of a fly season, you might be able to use two short actings either side of that. Um, and crutching and shearing can also be used to reduce what we call selection pressure that a chemical does when it's on the fleece. So when you've applied that chemical to the sheep, the effective um, concentration may no longer be there, but as long as that insecticide is still in the environment, it's still capable of selecting for resistance on the sheep. So if you shear that wool off, as long as it's inside the, select, inside the um, wool harvesting period, you're taking that out of, this, out of the system. So it's a bit like a, a tail cutter drench, really. Um, and if you're going to do that, do any of these, um, always observe the wool harvesting interval that's listed on the products. And often, depending on where you are what, uh, and what the climate in your area is like and what the prevailing weather conditions are, um, if your sheep are in short wool, you may actually eliminate um, any need for an autumn treatment. You might may get through that autumn period without it. One of the important things to know is how long the risk period is. Um, you know, can you use two shorter acting treatments or do you need to have a longer acting um, chemical? And is there resistance on your property or in your area? Um, if there is resistance, you need to be uh, aware that it doesn't mean that the chemical won't work, it just means that the protection period you get may be less than the label claim and that uh, you need to be looking at your animals more frequently and you might need to do multiple treatments rather than just a single treatment. And one that's important I think for everybody to know is, and most producers know this, but it's a good thing to double check is when the fly, when is the highest risk period of fly strike on your property and how long does that last for? So there's this really great tool on Flyboss. Um, it's been developed by Brian Horton at the University of Tasmania and Brian's um, spent years doing um, this type of modelling. And you can read there that um, it, this uh, pulls on 30 years worth of data to develop this model. This is the new version that is downloadable. And the trick you need to know is when you click on it, you need to go to your downloads to find the file and to put it into the folder that you've created. So this is new. Um, for those of you who haven't used it before, I'll quickly run through it. Um, it has a property tab where you can select um, your exactly where your property is um, and this gives you the longitude and la the latitude and the file to download into your to put into your folder. You can actually select the type of sheep that you're concerned about or you may be concerned about all of them. There's a wool tab that allows you to con 
compare two management strategies and in those you can input the dates of a single shearing or if you're shearing twice in a year. A lot of producers that I've spoken to over the last two or three years, some of them have moved to shearing six monthly because it suits their system and it's economically viable. Um, or you can put in one crutching or two crutchings and other producers have moved to two crutchings um, because that's what works for their system. There's a tab down the bottom where you can select unmulesed or mulesed. The next tab is the chemicals tab. And as you can see here, you can select no treatment or you can uh, press on the drop down and select a treatment. And then these tabs come up. And on this tab, you can select whether there's body, whether you're concerned with body strike, breech strike, or body and breech strike. Then um, this optimise dates comes up, and um, it can actually optimise. I've put in two treatments here, and it can optimise the dates of the treatment for your property. A really cool thing that comes up is an error message. So if I've gone at the front and told them when I want to shear or when I want to crutch and then I've put in a treatment and it's going to clash, it tells you that you must, the, the length of period of time that you must allow between shearing and treatment. Um, you can also go directly with this button to Flyboss to check on products. The next tab is, is, this is also new, and this is a great thing. This is where you can um, enter your breach and fleece rot scores. Um, all of those things that you're now 100% familiar with, breach wrinkle, breach cover, DAG score, um, and you can select whether they're mulesed or unmulesed. And what you end up with is a graph like this for every month of the year, and the risk of fly strike on your property. The line across the bottom here that's just flat is other fly strike so that's pole and pizzle the green one here is actually um, body strike the purple one is breech strike and then the thick brown one is um, all combined what i'm going to quickly run through is um, for a property that Justine sent through the information for. Just to show you the difference, this is the online Flyboss tool, which is a bit more basic than that one that I showed you. And I'll quickly go through it and show you how to use it. It pulls data from the closest um, weather station and for the coordinates that I was given, Gundawindi Airport is the closest, so it's somewhere there near the border. Um, and you can select whether they're mules or unmules, to put your shearing dates in, put when you do your first crutching and select your chemicals treatments, first or second crutching, first or second chemical treatment. What I'd like to show you is um, this, pro this property, they actually shear in mid-June and then they crutch in mid-March. So if I only put in the shearing and crutching dates and then I look at something with a high breach score so no, and a low, so clean breach versus non-clean breach, you can see the difference in the risk, especially given that this isn't really to scale because this blue here is actually that blue and the green there. So your risk for um, breach strike is pretty high. If we add a treatment in early October to that same scenario, you can see that um, that whole area has totally disappeared and our main risk area becomes February through to March. This is again with with not a clean, this is a clean breach and, and on the left is um, something that's not really a clean breach. You can see with a clean breach that breach um, risk of breach strike is reduced even further. And then if I was to add a treatment in the first week of February, that gave say up to 12 weeks protection, you can see that the risk is virtually removed and high breach score or clean breach 
um, it sort of makes it irrelevant. Um, I think last year there was unseasonal rains because this producer had treated in April and from the modelling of this, I, the, the treatment in April was because of unseasonally late rains um, and for all this model, when I put it through, um, that treatment in April based on the, this 30-year uh, average data um, would have afforded um, no protection because according to the model, there was no risk at that time. So again, you need to know, are you experiencing unseasonal um, conditions for your area? I'd just like to wind up with what is from the strategy and from the data that I've presented today, what's been um, sort of is best practice. So the first really important um, point is to look at your product and know what the active ingredient is and then know what insecticide group that belongs to so that when you rotate, you are rotating between groups. And remember, ceromazin and dicyclinal belong to the same group, even though they're slightly different. They are both IGRs. Um, yep, so rotate your insecticide groups if it's practicable. Try and minimise the number of treatments by having a look if you can play around at all, if you have any leeway at all to change crutching dates or or, um, or if you're developing a longer term plan where you do intend to, to change crutching or, or shearing dates, you can muck around with that model and see what it, what when it's most effective and, and uh, for your actual um, enterprise. And again, rotate to a different group. Always consider the treatments used for both lice. If you remember back to that sort of flow diagram, that was step number one. And also for worms, there are some chemicals that are also registered um, and are present in drenches. Um, I suppose I'm thinking of the MLs um, with that. Um, apply the insecticide carefully and are strictly according to the label. In resistance terms, it is as important not to overdose than it is to underdose. Um, and a lot of people don't realise that they may just continue to put on more and more and more of the insecticide. You need to be monitoring fly strike frequently. If you think back to that um, slide where I showed the difference between the covert strike and the overt strike, there may be a lot more going on that you, you haven't yet seen. And it's recommended that you do that every second day in the peak fly strike season. When you're cleaning up an existing strike, it's incredibly important to kill the maggots that come off that strike. You can stomp on them if you're on cement if you want to, but the best thing is to gather them up with a dustpan and broom, tie them in a plastic bag and stick them out in the sun. They're just like you and I. They need to breathe oxygen and they can be overheated and, and die of, um, of overheating the same as we can because these will be, those maggots become the flies that will be striking your, your sheep uh, in the next few weeks. And overall, reduce the reliance on insecticide if you can, because that will slow down the development of resistance. I'd just like to acknowledge AWI for the co-funding for this project with New South Wales DPI. Um, the great job that Brian Horton has done and has always done on um, the tools that are found on Flyboss. Uh, this is the AWI Sheep Blowfly Resistance Management Strategy Working Group that I, that I mentioned. They're the people who sat on that to, to come up with this rotation strategy. And a disclaimer um, uh, for AWI and New South Wales DPI, um, you need to be able to tailor what's best for your enterprise. You may be doing mixed cropping and a whole range of other things. So even though I tell you um, in theory, for, from insecticide resistance theory, what's best to do, you may not actually be able to do that on your property. Um, so that's it for me, um, Justine. Thanks a lot, Narelle. I'll just flip this back to me. Um, 
Sorry. Okay, I'm back. Norella, if you don't mind just keeping your mic on, we've only got a couple of questions and I'm not quite sure if anything else will come in, but I just had one where um, a chap was just asking the results from the farms where there was, um, you know, efficacy issues um, with um, the products. Was there, were they already um, having suspect efficacy issues on those places in the, you know, for the trial, or did you find you got a real range of um, submissions? So people that had no idea if they had um, resistance to chemicals or people that were actively having issues? We had representation from just about every group um, and we did count that and work out the percentage um, and that is in that final report. Yes, there were some producers who were uh, struggling and, and were well aware that they'd had um, uh, sort of issues for several years. We had some producers who considered that they had no issues at all um, but were just interested to find out so um, decided to collect a sample and, and put it in. So we did, ha we did have representation from all of those um, uh, um, in and I must say, even though we found 100% resistance in New South Wales, um, some producers were still saying that they were happy with their treatment. So they were receiving the protection that they protection period that they expected from that product. So it it is very much about um, we look for that genetic we look for that those individuals where that genetic change has occurred. These insecticides are put on at high concentrations um, and then they degrade. So it's that length of the period over which it degrades which gives you the protection period. When that change has occurred, at the beginning there should still be sufficient there to kill. It's just um, the, the length of that protection period that is um, maybe reduced if, res if resistance is there. We saw this with the OPs. They started off giving about 16 weeks protection, I think, and in the end they were giving less than four. So it's, a, it, it's not a new story. It's a, you know, we're very used to that, um, uh, you know, uh, not just with OPs but crops and, and a whole range of different things, worms, everything. Yeah, I mean, it's just what happens, isn't it, when you've got... Um an animal with a very short life cycle, virtually. Yeah. Insects are um, fabulous. They'll be around here when you and I aren't, Justine. So. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They keep us all in a job. Um, we had um, also another one um, was how far can an adult blowfly travel past, oh, you know, post its um, emergence from um, the ground? Okay, so so there's varying information around this. There was a study, if you look at the actual academic literature, there was a study that was carried on, uh, carried out in America against Lucilia caprina. And it was a, a study to actually look how far they could fly. And they found that they flew for 10 miles, which is roughly 16 kilometres. But if if the flies can find everything that they need close by, they won't travel any further than what they have to. So they have the capacity to fly a large distance, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they will. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just had one here um, from a producer um, that just said uh, are some of these products becoming a bit obsolete as last year they got about four weeks coverage um, from a product. But I suppose it's a bit what you were saying, Narelle, it depends on your property, doesn't it? So for this producer, that product has more limited use than it may for another producer and they have to tailor um, their, their management plan for their own place. Would you think that would be the case. I mean there's there's also a whole range of factors that that can actually um, that can actually affect your treatment once you've put it on. Um, you know we I said in the the original you know that it has to be applied according to the manufacturer's instructions and that is from you know from, to the very tip of the tail back of the head that you know 
some products you require two stripes, two spurt stripes, some you, ne you need one, that breach area, you know, it, you, really, um, you really have to do a good job to, to get, uh, you know, to, to give the product the best possible chance of um, working. You know, a lot of people have tried to decide how much rain would need to be uh, to happen after a treatment, however many weeks later before it would no longer be effective. And again, some of these products are water-based, some of them aren't. Some of them are what we call lipophilic, which means they actually um, bond into the wool grease a bit. Um, and so there's there's a whole range of factors that can affect the performance of a treatment that may have nothing to do with resistance, or they may have to do, or they may actually be because of resistance. What I should have said, Justine, um, and I I'm, I apologise. When we were screening all of those strains for resistance to dicyclinol, pretty early on we realised that um, we could differentiate the strains into low, medium and higher level resistance. That susceptible discriminating concentration, SDC, that I talked about at the end, if they survived that, they were considered low level. If they survived four times that, they were considered medium if they survived eight times that level, they were considered higher level resistance. So we, so it, it depends very much really what level resistance you also have on your property because um, for, for dicyclinal resistance, we have just been able to discriminate between these three uh, sort of different levels. Ceromazin is a different kettle of fish. It's low level. We've done the same thing, trying to look for differences and everything um, do, only survives the low level, doesn't survive any of those multiple levels of that discriminating concentration. Okay, I, I think this question sort of ties into that too. Um, just a producer had asked where he can send samples to um, for resistance analysis and that probably ties in a little bit with if people are suspicious they've got an issue, they're better off finding out whether they have or not, but it's to DPIs and EMAI is where we send them up. Is that correct? Yes. So unfortunately, um, because the project is finished, we can no longer do those for free. For the last 12 months, we've been trialling doing them for the same price as drench resistance testing. Um, it, it doesn't cover the cost, but I I do a bit of work for do a bit of other work on <laughs> to earn money to do some to be able to cover that cost of of wages and such. Um, so yes, they can send them in to us, but um, if they email me, I can send them um, an information sheet and the um, cost of of what it would cost. So I apologise for not being able to do it for free anymore. Um, but um, yeah, I I have to hire people. We've got to pay for consumables and all the rest of it, so I apologise. It's quite labour intensive, but there is that facility yeah. to do it. And um, I could, if you send me those things, I could probably send it out when we email out the um, presentation so people have it. But, um, or, you know, if you're having problems on your place, get onto your district vet and see if they can help you out um, doing that. Also, um, we just had a question about why does an overdose of chemical product applied also create resistance in five populations? So if we go back to that slide that I had where there was the level of resistance, how high, and then on the other side, the frequency of resistance, how many, when you are applying, if you already have, this is, if you already have resistance on your property, if those flies are already resistant, if you continue to increase the, the amount of insecticide that you use, you will pretty much continue to push that level of resistance higher and higher. We have a strain of um, flies here in the lab that we have been doing exactly that too, and we know that you can continue to increase that level of resistance. The other thing you're doing is you're um, increasing the frequency too, because only those super resistant ones will survive at those higher 
concentrations. So virtually 100% of what's surviving will be the highly resistant ones. It's a little bit different than the concept of refugia with worms and drenches where you want to maintain the susceptibles so that uh, there's all that theory, you know, not theory, there's a whole strategy around um, maintaining that refugia. It's a little bit um, different to that, but by having that higher level in the um, in the environment, um, if there are if there already is resistance, you will continue to push it higher and increase the frequency of yeah. resistant individuals. Okay, just two very quick questions. Um, if I'm seeing blowflies during winter, and I know. Um, just, I think it's, type of, it, it's not quite 15 degrees yet. Does that mean they will still reach adult stages regardless of these environmental conditions? So I suppose they've been getting strikes in the winter but would think that the environmental conditions weren't possibly warm enough. Yeah, and, and I must say it, it's incredibly interesting over the period of time when we did this study, um, you know, there was only a few weeks of the year when we weren't receiving samples from somewhere. Um, so there, are, there seems to be fly strike going on somewhere. You know, there's favourable conditions somewhere just about most of the year. Um, in, the, in those southern states, and, and this is why I think in those southern areas, uh, I think Victoria is probably better off than New South Wales because they have a colder winter and you actually um, put that stop to, to the population and they go into the ground. When they're in the ground, they are actually vulnerable. Um, they, they're vulnerable to being flooded if you get rain. Uh, they drown. Um, they're vulnerable to being eaten by um, other insects uh, like ants or, or a whole range of different things. So you can knock your population down during that time. Um, there is a thing called fitness modifiers and when a resistance has been present for a while, um, the insects get other genetic modifications that mean that the resistant individuals are as fit as the susceptible ones. Often these resistances when they occur, um, they might be resistant in the presence of the chemical, but when there's no chemical, they, it may even be a lethal gene, like they may not be able to survive. So, But once they've selected these fitness modifiers, they are as, um, they are in, as environmentally fit as uh, uh, the susceptible ones and um, you don't get that knocking of the population uh, like that reset on resistance which you get with chemicals that um, that uh, haven't had resistance where fitness modifiers have been um, collected. Um, a study was done in 2012 um, where uh, the overwintering population was looked at and the flies uh, down in a very cold area of New South Wales and the flies that were emerged that were in that first emergent slot were found to be dicyclinal resistant. So that tells us that there isn't that they're not getting knocked off during that overwintering period. Yep. Okay. And then just the very last one is um, what sort of level of rainfall do you think would be almost high enough to have a significant bearing on the protection period? Are we talking about like, you know, really big rains? Well, this, this is the thing. Like I said, a lot of people have, have, have um, tossed a lot of done a lot of calculations and, and used a lot of different figures. It very much depends on your sheep the length of your wool, whether or not you used a water-based or a, or a non-water-based formulation. Um, uh, some of the products claim um, that the chemical becomes locked in the fleece. Um, so it really is, very much depends on the your fleece, your sheep, how much... Um, protection they can even get in your paddock you know or whether they're just out out just getting totally drenched all the time um, 
and uh, there's a whole heap of variables. So yeah, I wouldn't wouldn't say how much anywhere at any time. I wouldn't put my um, neck out and, and and say really. No. Oh, well, that's great, Narelle. I think um, we'll let everyone um, go there. It was a really good webinar. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed it. And thank you so much, Narelle, for giving up so much time. And everyone, I've been pestering Narelle for about two weeks. So the poor thing's been bombarded by continual emails and things from me as so I try and get myself organised. And I'd also like to thank um, Leonie Coleman, who works in the um, NRM team for Northwest Local Land Service, which she knew how to run web webinars, and um, Jackie Grillman, who does all our communications and media and just joined us recently, but they're in the background making sure I don't completely stuff this up today. <laughs> so, it's been, it, it wasn't quite the blind leading the blind, but I was, I was definitely stomping around with a white stick for a while with this, but, um, but thanks everyone for for um, participating and we're definitely going to, to send this out um, as a recording so I know quite a few people couldn't get on and thinks it's always hard or people have been diverted and I did see there were a couple of other little questions but I'm going to get um, Narelle to just email you because I were very specific Narelle I think you know people having big issues so I thought that might just be a, a better thing to deal with one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but look, thanks everyone. There's a little survey at the end that just comes up when I click off this. And um, yeah, thanks for participating and hopefully we can run um, something else in the future. If you're keen to learn a bit more about the Flyboss workshop, oh, not workshop, what do you call it, the management tool, um, we're happy to try and facilitate something around that. But you've got to let us know if you do want to do that. And also, Northwest LLS will be doing a webinar on worms in the coming weeks because that's our other big summertime issue, I think, really will be will be worms, um, especially as we start warming up because uh, the old barber's pole will get cracking. But the one thing I did take heart from Narelle was when you said that um, the pupae like to drown or the larvae in the, in the ground. So I thought we've had some good floods up here. <laughs> Well, a big sigh of relief. So, uh, yeah, so sometimes people don't um, attribute to insects exactly the same things uh, as yourself, you know, like, like having to. But I tell you one thing, they've got it all over us. They can actually, the maggots can breathe through their bottoms so they never need to stop eating. So we, we can't do that, but um, <laughs> so um, the, there's an adaption to aim for. <laughs> Well, yeah, and thank you, thank you, Justine, for the opportunity. I greatly appreciate it. That's all right. Thanks for all your time and help with it, too, Narelle. Thanks, everyone. Have a lovely afternoon. Bye.